All right. Welcome to our meeting, Jesus in the Gospel of Luke study. Uh, I want to set your uh, expectations. Uh, this is going to take the full 40, 45 minutes this morning. Uh, as we get started here, as you've already done, feel free to use the chat to uh, say hi to somebody you see. And if you have any questions during our uh, time together, uh, use the chat function for that as well. So I may not be able to answer um, all your questions at the time, but I will try to uh, at the end. Um, also, I just want to let you know, breakout groups uh, start next week. Uh, so these breakout groups are discussion groups that are going to happen following the main teaching. Uh, they're totally optional for those of you who'd like to take part, and they're going to start uh, next week. Before we begin, I, I do want to pray, but um, I feel particularly compelled to pray for some of the events that have happened in our nation over the past few weeks. Um, I am incredibly disheartened, as I know many of you are. And I know these stories have unfortunately been on endless repeat, uh, but first it was a Ahmaud Arbery's jog through a neighborhood, and it was a man bird watching in Central Park, and then of course it was George Floyd in Minneapolis and everything that's happened since. And, and I find myself so troubled in spirit. And I don't claim to hear the voice of God audibly speaking to me, but I am quite certain that the trouble in my spirit is the Holy Spirit. And now I recognize that most of you, I'm sure, with me and your hearts break as well and, and you long to see justice come, to see racial justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, to quote Amos 5.24. And so what I'm about to say, I don't think I'm talking to any of you in particular Refuge Church. I hope not. I don't think I am. Um, but I do kind of have to get something off my chest. <laughs> there is a community... 13% uh, of the American population, so what is that, 40 to 45 million people that are grieving right now, not all in the same way, but they have long been crying out to God, lamenting, how long, O oh Lord? Uh, there's an entire community, a large percentage of whom, 80% according to Pew Research, who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, crying out in such deep sorrow and anguish. And it is a particularly cruel callousness generated and birthed by Satan himself, that responds to the cries of Black Americans and Black American Christians with anything other than weeping alongside them and joining their cries. To respond to their anguish with, you know, moralistic finger wagging at looters, which everyone knows is wrong, or to respond to their cries with so-called rational arguments about the facts of each case, to respond what you might even consider your own cool-headed, emotionless logic is not a strength, and it's not a sign of intelligence, and that posture represents no discernible virtue, at least in the Christian catalog. And, and this, friends, is, is one of the reasons, anyways, I'm excited about our series, Meeting Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. This is why I'm so passionate about learning to read the Bible well, because when we learn to read the Bible well, and we meet Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, it has the power to dismantle every systemic injustice. It has the power to take down every spiritual stronghold. And the Gospel of Luke will insist that God calls the privilege to repent, and that if you want to feel the heart of God breathing, or heart of God beating and throbbing, and I know you do, and if you want to feel his breath, and if you want to shake in his presence, then you're going to have to meet him on the margins where the groans for justice emerge, where the cries for help can be heard. And what we're going to find in the Gospel of Luke is that Jesus just ain't got much time for those in the center, for those with power, because his kingdom is coming and his spirit is moving. And those in power in the Gospel of Luke, of course, are going to have to murder him if they want to stop him. And of course, even that won't work because then he'll rise from the dead. So with that, will you just join me in prayer before we begin? God, we lament, and we join the cries for all those who have long been crying out and saying, how long, O oh Lord? And I admit, and I'm sure many of us can, that we do not know what it's, so many of us do not know what it's like to live in another person's skin and to walk in their shoes. Would you give us empathy and compassion? Would you give us peace? We do pray for peace, but even more than that, God, don't, don't trade peace for justice. We do want justice. 
we want full healing and full restoration and full reconciliation. And we know that it is the very power of your spirit that once hovered and, and, and moved over those waters in the very beginning of creation. It is the power of your spirit which can, which can renew and recreate something more beautiful. We pray, God, that it would start with us, that revival would start in our own hearts, that, that we would be the first to repent, that we would be the first to say, if there is any wicked way within me, would you point it out, God? Bring your justice first to our own hearts, that we might then extend that to others. We pray for this time. We pray that you would teach us, you would enlighten us, you would mold us and shape us, so that we might look more and more like your son, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. All right, this morning, we're not going to be getting into the Gospel of Luke itself. Uh, that's going to start next week. This morning, I want to give you an overview of what we're doing in this series. And I want to talk about our goals. And the goals are to meet Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and to learn to read the Bible well. And I want to talk about these in more detail uh, this morning. So the first is to meet Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Now, this seems pretty straightforward and simple, and to some degree it is. I'm sure at least some of you are thinking, well, thanks, Ryan, but I don't need to meet Jesus. In fact, we were just talking together earlier this morning. Like, in other words, this might seem like a weird goal because many of us have already met him. And, and even if you wouldn't say you've never met Jesus, like you wouldn't use that verb, I'm guessing all of us know some things about him. We've heard things. We've read things. We never start with a blank slate. When we read the Gospel of Luke, we are meeting a character that we already have some thoughts about or some experiences with. And so we're gonna do a little activity to dive deeper into this. I'm gonna show you some pictures of Jesus, artistic representations of Jesus throughout the centuries, some new, some old, and I want you to vote for the picture that most looks like Jesus to you. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Here are the pictures and let me uh, put up the poll. All right, uh, so you've got to vote. It's anonymous, just so you know. It's anonymous. I won't know what you choose. And you got to vote, though. you got to vote for one. And I will make a few comments about these pictures uh, after you vote. So do this quickly. I'm only going to give you another 10 seconds or so. All right, a lot more of you have to vote. we got five people voting so far. Ryan, go back a slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll give you 10 seconds uh, longer to vote. Oh, there we go. I didn't see how many. Okay. All right. Five more seconds. Three, two, one. We're going to end the poll and I'm going to show you uh, the results to the poll. So what's interesting is that none of you voted for the oldest artistic representation of Jesus in this collection, um, which is actually number two. Let me make a few comments about uh, uh, these pictures. Um, picture number one is a Chinese portrayal of Jesus. Can't remember the date. It's not too old, 19th or 20th century. Uh, picture number two, as I mentioned, is the oldest. It's not the oldest that we have. I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, but it is the oldest in this collection. It's a fourth century mosaic of Jesus from somewhere in England. And what's interesting about this photo, uh, I think, is the jawline, or it's not a, it's a mosaic, but it's a photo of a mosaic. Uh, what's interesting is the jawline and the cleft chin. Do you notice that? Interestingly, this fourth century portrayal of Jesus looks remarkably similar to someone else from the fourth century. Does anybody else want to guess what that is? I already showed the, the slide. But it is the Emperor Constantine, Roman Emperor from the fourth century. And it makes you wonder if the artist intentionally portrayed Jesus in the image of the emperor. Uh, Constantine, if you don't know, was the one who essentially legalized Christianity in the fourth century. And in the decades to follow, Christianity then spread all throughout the Roman Empire, even into places like England, where this uh, mosaic was created. Uh, picture number three is an Ethiopian portrayal of Jesus. Not sure the precise date, perhaps the 19th century. 
Uh, picture number four is a, I believe a medieval or early Renaissance painting of Jesus. Uh, it's been a long time since I, I found this uh, painting. I wanna say it's a medieval Spanish painting. And if you look closely at Jesus's facial structure, skin tone, Jesus in fact looks like a medieval Spanish uh, male nobleman, lord, king, something like that. Picture number five is a modern Filipino portrayal of Jesus. Uh, he's uh, kind of portrayed as a common man wearing a white t-shirt. Picture number six, obviously a black or African American portrayal of Jesus. Picture seven, so probably looks familiar to you and I see it got 24% of the vote. Uh, so this picture was created in 1940 and over the next five decades became one of the most ubiquitous portrayals of Jesus throughout America and beyond. You'll notice Jesus in this picture has blue eyes. If you look closely, he has white skin and golden brown locks. Uh, picture number eight, so, so it got some votes. I'm sorry this picture isn't better. It also is very old. It's a sixth century mosaic that was originally in some cathedral in Rome. And Jesus, if you can tell, actually has fairly dark skin in this portrayal. Uh, picture number nine, so I'm actually surprised that, that so many of you picked this one. Maybe you've seen this picture before. This was from a National Geographic magazine from some years ago, and it was the work of scientists and archaeologists who put together what they thought was the most objective portrayal of Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, it, what they thought was the um, likeliest face of Jesus based on what they know about first century Palestinian Jewish facial structures. Now, is this what Jesus actually looked like? We have absolutely no idea, but you could make the argument that number nine is the most objective portrayal of Jesus in the entire collection. Okay, we're going to do uh, one more of these. Um, I want to do, uh, I, I want you to do this one more time. Uh, this time, the question is going to be slightly different. Okay, I'm going to show you another group of pictures. Um, and uh, this time, I want you to vote for the picture that best represents Jesus, his character and value. So not so much his physical look, but who he was as a person, his character and values. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Here's the photo. And uh, let me put up the poll. All right, so try not to get caught up on the artistic merit or value of the work. And also try not to get caught up on the racial or ethnic features. Which portrayal best represents the character and values of Jesus? What he was like? Uh, what's most important to understand or remember about him? And, and you have to pick one, okay? Even if you don't like any of the options. So we're gonna give you a few more seconds here. Five more seconds. Wow, there's one that is just breezing ahead all of the rest. It's not totally surprising to me. All right, we're gonna end this poll and I'm gonna show you the results. Uh, so it looks like the majority of you, uh, two thirds of you voted for number one, got a few votes for number two, uh, one for four, one for five. I think I know who that is, no, I'm just kidding. And then a few for uh, 10. Um, so let me just uh, comment uh, on a few of these uh, uh, pictures. And uh, after I comment on these pictures, you don't get to change your vote. So just to let you know. Uh, picture number one, to me, this is a reflective, quiet, peaceful Jesus. The Jesus you'd want to have a quiet time with. You know, in this picture, you know, he's probably unemployed, but he's chill. He's, he's pondering life. Maybe he's a hipster. He's spending time with his father, something like that. Picture number two. I call this the Tony Robbins or motivational Jesus. This is the Jesus that wants to remind you that you're doing a great job. You should keep up the great work. Uh, picture number three is actually a, a famous painting, although the technical term for it is, um, is an icon and it's from the uh, sixth century. And if Jesus's face looks weird to you, it's because you're actually looking at it wrong. So let me show you a larger version. So if you want to look at this icon properly, what you need to do is you need to take your right hand, cover up the right side of his face as you're looking at him, and you'll notice then on his left side that he has some nice gentle facial features, right? And then switch. Take your left hand, cover up the left side of his face so that you're just looking at the right side. It's a lot scarier, isn't it? The facial features are sharper. They're more ominous and piercing. This icon 
from the sixth century is an attempt to represent the dual nature of Christ, the left side of his face portraying his softer humanity and the right side of his face portraying his more serious divinity. So the point here is that this is actually a theological representation of Jesus as being both man and God. Picture number four is a Roman emperor, empire period mosaic, uh, very old. You'll notice Jesus is depicted as a Roman soldier trampling on his foes. Picture number five, I call the Che Guevara Jesus. Uh, che Guevara, if you don't know, is a 20th century Marxist revolutionary, guerrilla warfare leader in South America. And Jesus is made here to look like the very famous silhouette of Che Guevara. Uh, picture number six, you might have thought this was the hunter Jesus, but it's actually related to number five. It also pictures Jesus as a South American guerrilla fighter, reading with his gun to resist Western capitalistic imperialism. Uh, picture number seven is an Indian representation of Jesus. You'll notice that Jesus is perfectly at peace, sitting in something like the pose of the Buddha, emerging from and surrounded by lotus flowers, which represent his purity and his enlightenment. Picture number eight uh, is the Wall Street executive Jesus. I believe this painting actually was intended to be a critique of how Americans have perceived Jesus. The title of the painting is The Conformist. And this is the Jesus who is there to do nothing more than to give you tips on how to run a successful business and gain more influence, power, and money. Picture number nine is Jesus dying on a cross holding two American flags. So this is Jesus dying for our sins, simultaneously thinking of America while breathing his last. And then picture number 10, which I'm actually surprised got some votes, is an ancient mosaic of Jesus portrayed as a Greek philosopher uh, wearing a toga, uh, surrounded by his students, teaching them philosophical and ethical principles, perhaps. Now, why did I show you all of these pictures and have you vote? Here's why. I'm guessing that even if you didn't like any of the voting options, even if you felt like none of the artistic representations did justice to the Jesus in your imagination, I'm guessing that you didn't feel the same about all of them. Some of the pictures you loved or at least liked, some you hated, some made you feel comfortable, some made you feel fairly uncomfortable. And what that reveals is that all of us have a mental representation of Jesus in our minds. What he looked like, perhaps, what he valued, what he was all about, what his political persuasion might have been, what his personality was like. And so when we come to the Gospel of Luke, we bring those preconceived notions with us. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way it is. You know, another thing we notice from these representations is that people have a tendency to see Jesus in their own image. So Chinese Christians might want to perceive Jesus as Chinese. Black Christians might want to perceive Jesus as black. White Christians might want to perceive Jesus as white and so on and so forth. And this also isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, people have been doing this for the past 2,000 years. Remember the fourth century mosaic that made Jesus look like Roman Emperor Constantine or the Spanish medieval Jesus. Christians have always been perceiving Jesus to some degree in their own image. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. After all, the good news of the incarnation is that in Jesus, God became one of us. And so it's only natural, and perhaps it's quite important, to conceive of Jesus as looking like you. Now, if you're a lady right now, you're thinking he doesn't look like me, but if you remove the beard from a few of the picture, maybe he does. Okay, anyways, there's a danger here, isn't there? The danger is that when you meet Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, you might end up just meeting yourself. You might end up meeting a Jesus who looks like you, talks like you, acts like you, cares about what you care about, has your political persuasion. In other words, you may not meet Jesus at all. You might just be meeting yourself. You know, another way of putting this is to say that we all bring lenses to the Gospel of Luke, and those lenses are formed by our theology, our politics, our race, our ethnicity, our tradition. I mean, I, expect, I, I suspect that some of you chose that white-skinned, blue-eyed Jesus, not because you've really thought that through and you believe Jesus is white, but simply because that's the tradition in which you were raised. You were taught to visualize Jesus in that way, and so it's most comfortable. We bring our lenses to the Gospel of Luke and the Jesus we meet there. And the thing about lenses, if you think about it, is that they allow you to see some things in sharp clarity, but they obscure other things. You know, reading glasses help you see certain things up close in sharp clarity, but those same glasses make it impossible to see what's far away. 
And that's what happens when, with the lenses that we bring to the Bible. And so what that means for our goal in this series is that if we want to meet Jesus, we have to become increasingly aware of the lenses we bring to the text. Our theologies, our politics, our race, ethnicity, our values, our personality. This is also, however, why it's so important to read the Bible in community. Unless you were reading the Bible in a community in which everyone is the exact same, the people in your community have different lenses, don't they? And so as you converse with them and study the Bible with them, you'll notice that because of your different lenses, you'll be able together to see more of the picture. There will be certain things you notice that they don't, and there will be certain things they notice that you don't. And together, hopefully, you get to see more of the picture. Here's a bonus for you. This is actually the earliest artistic representation of Jesus dating back to the second century. It is graffiti, so not fine art, scratched onto a wall in Rome. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a character on the left who is in some posture of worship. And then there's a person on a cross in the center with a donkey's head. And you can't read the inscription, but it says in Greek beneath, Alexamenos worships his God. Uh, if this is a representation of Jesus, and most scholars think it is, it is obviously mocking both Jesus and those who worship him. And that's the earliest one we have. Anyways, that's enough about our first goal. Let's move on to our second. What makes for reading the Bible well? What process should we go through? Before we begin, let me say this. There is nothing wrong and everything right with reading the Bible devotionally. You read the Bible, perhaps you reflect on what it means for a second or two, and you pray. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the same thing as reading the Bible well or studying the Bible well. Reading the Bible well is a process. Now, before I get into this process, let me say something as a warning. I am going to probably overwhelm you, or at least some of you. I know there are middle schoolers taking part in this study. I know we all have different educational levels. And I'm not going to dumb this down because you're smart enough. You're smart enough and capable enough to learn, learn even some new fancy words this morning. But here's what this might feel like for some of you. Has anyone studied abroad or spent time in a non-English speaking country for more than two weeks? If you have, go ahead and type where you've been into the chat. I have it myself, but I remember my roommate in college spent a semester in Russia, I think near St. Petersburg. And I remember him studying Russian prior to his semester there. He'd listen to CDs, he'd write some things down on index cards. He learned to ask where the nearest bathroom was. He learned how to ask how much something cost. But then he went to Russia. And you can only imagine, I know some of you can because you know the experience, he went to Russia and the first few days, if not the first few weeks, it felt totally overwhelming. He didn't know what was happening. He could pick up on a word here or there, but everything was so fast, his head was spinning, it was hard. But something slowly started happening. As the weeks turned into months, he became more comfortable. He could carry on conversations about the weather, about food, about family relationships. By the time his semester was over, he had a fairly strong working command of Russian. It didn't mean he knew everything. It didn't mean he could have deep philosophical conversations about the meaning of some obscure passage in Tolstoy, but he knew his way around. He knew enough to find his way and to interact and become more comfortable with his surroundings. Listen. Today is your first day in Russia. <laughs> Today for some of you will be your first day in Russia and it's okay if your head is spinning and you think I'm going too fast. You'll have time to catch up. Things will start to slow down and you'll get it. And you'll start being able to apply what we're talking about here in your own personal study of the Bible. So with that said, let's talk about the process of reading the Bible well. I've broken it up into four stages or four steps. And first I'll give you an overview and then we'll look at the first one in more detail. The first step is to observe. What's going on? What do I notice? We'll spend the bulk of our time talking about this in detail in just a moment. The second step is to question. Ask yourself, what do I need to know or further explore in this passage? Are there resources that can help me? What's confusing? What doesn't make sense? Write down your questions and follow your curiosities. This is obviously connected to step one. In fact, step one and two happen at the same time. You're taking note of what you know, and you're taking note of what you don't know. And I'll talk about the use of commentaries and other resources in a future week. But this is where you'd want to find some help if it's available. The third step is to determine. 
So here we want to think through the meaning or meanings of a particular text. The goal here is to be able to write down in a single sentence what the text essentially means. Now, I don't buy into the theory that you need to just figure out the one main point. And I think that can create unnecessary anxiety about whether you got it right. And that's not actually how ancient writers wrote. Historical narratives, for instance, don't just have one point or one meaning. They have multiple meanings. But what we're trying to do here in this step is to try and write single sentences that capture or explain what's going on and what Luke is telling us about Jesus and Jesus's kingdom. The fourth and final step is to reflect. So if the Bible is simply a curious piece of ancient literature, then we might just stop at step three. But if the Bible is more than that, if it is somehow in some way inspired and breathed by God, then we can't stop with step three. We have to press on to step four and to reflect and ask ourselves, what is the text doing to me? What does the text want from me? Is it challenging me? Is it rebuking me? Is it disrupting me? Is it encouraging me? Is it enlightening me? Is it empowering me? Another way of putting this is to say that a proper reading of the Bible for a Christian is to understand the plain, plain meaning of the text. So that's our first goal, but also to stand under the plain meaning of the text, to figure out the text and also to let the text figure us out. All right, so we have to spend time reflecting and asking the Holy Spirit to guide us so that we are putting into practice whatever we're learning. All right, so those are the four stages. For the rest of our time, we're going to zoom in on the first step, observing. Let's look at this one in more detail. The first thing we're going to observe when studying the Bible is the text itself, whatever passage we're looking at. There are a number of observations we might make about a particular passage, but the first thing we might want to do when we're looking at the text is to establish the original. Here's the thing. We don't have the original texts of the Bible. What we have are copies and copies of copies and copies of copies of copies. They're called manuscripts and we have thousands of them. Here's the earliest known manuscript. You're looking at one manuscript, you're looking at both sides of it. It was discovered in an ancient book called a codex that was bought from an Egyptian market in 1920. So quite the find at the Egyptian uh, bazaar. And this has been subsequently dated to the second century, perhaps even the first half of the second century, 125 to 150. And what you're looking at, as I mentioned, is both the front and back of the manuscript. And specifically, you're looking at John 18 in which Jesus is interacting with Pontius Pilate. So this is the earliest that we have, and it's obviously just a fragment. We have manuscripts of very small portions of the New Testament like this one, and we have manuscripts that are entire Gospels, and some that are even the entire New Testament and entire Bible, from the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th, and then, of course, we have thousands of them from later centuries, the 11th, 12th, and 13th. Here's the thing. No manuscript is perfect, so far as we can tell because there are differences between them, lots of little differences. And the fancy way of putting this is to say that there are variants or discrepancies in the manuscript tradition. And most of the discrepancies are simple scribal errors. You know, you can kind of imagine a well-meaning scribe working late into the evening by candlelight. Perhaps he was somewhere in Europe and coffee hadn't yet been introduced from Africa. That didn't happen until the 17th century or so. So he's under caffeinated, he's tired, his vision starts blurring, and he skips a line as he's copying, or he misses a letter or a word or a phrase. Those are the most common variants or discrepancies, minor scribal errors. There are more significant ones. Some scribes appear to change things intentionally, removing lines or phrases that they deem troubling. Sometimes they add lines into the text. That um, picture on the right is a very famous manuscript called Codex Sinaiticus. It's the entire Bible, and it is considered incredibly valuable. I think it's from the third or fourth century, and it's considered to be very accurate. But even Codex Sinaiticus, interestingly, removes some of the most difficult words of Jesus in the Gospels, specifically those lines where he commands us to bless our enemies. Now, does that mean that particular scribe uh, took out those lines? No, it's possible that the manuscript that he was working with 
had omitted that lines and he just copied the changes down, not knowing what was in the original. Uh, by the way, that that one to the left, I like that one. Uh, that's called, I think, P72, Papyrus 72. It is 1st, 2nd Peter and Jude. You're looking there at the end of 1st Peter and the beginning of 2nd Peter. And the reason why I like that is because of the doodles at the end of 1st Peter. I don't know what those are, little hurricane or tornadoes or something like that, but but I'm a doodler myself, so that scribe wanted to add a little flair to the end of First Peter. Anyways, it is the art of what is called textual criticism, whereby scholars look at all these manuscripts and using various tools and methodologies, they figure out what is most likely the original text. If you want more detail on how this works, we can for sure talk about this more later on. Um, especially if this is your first time hearing about this, we can run through some of those methodologies on a future Sunday. For the purposes of our study, we're gonna generally trust whatever English translation we're using. But here's something important to note. We're gonna see an example of this next week. When you read your Bible and you come across a small italicized letter, and then you track that to its appropriate footnote at the bottom, you might come across the phrase, some ancient authorities read or some early manuscripts read. What that means is that the translators are telling you that there is a variant in the manuscript tradition. And we may wanna take note of that and study up on it if it appears to be a significant difference. Okay, let's move on. The second thing we might observe in the text is the genre. The genre is the type or form of literature that something is. And it is so important to identify the genre whenever you're reading the Bible. Let me try to show you why genre is important, okay? So I'm gonna show you a piece of contemporary literature that is very near and dear to my heart. And I want you to identify the genre. You ready? What genre of literature is this? <laughs> it's a menu, right? It's from a menu. It's actually from the menu of what is hands down the best Thai restaurant in Albuquerque, Thai brand next to Flicks here on the west side. Just one more reason the West Side is the best side. Anyways, I'm now going to show you another piece of contemporary literature. Here it is. What genre is this? A recipe, right? <laughs> Obviously, now listen closely. The subject matter for both of these pieces of literature is the same, Pad Thai, which is a noodle dish. The subject matter is the same, but the genre is different, right? And think for a moment how differently you read a menu from a, a recipe. How do you read a menu? You start in the beginning with number one, reading every word until you get to the end. If you're weird, you do. Of course not. Like when you're reading a menu, you skim. You look for the things you like. If you don't like curry, you skip the curry section. If you like noodles, you focus on that. But listen, what if you chose to read a recipe like that? You know, I'm not really a fan of step ones, but I do like step three, so I'll just focus on those. Like, if you read a, uh, a recipe the way you read a menu, you've misread it, even though the subject matter is the same. Here's the point. Identifying the genre or form of literature tells you how to properly read and interpret the text. Let me give you two examples from the Gospel of Luke. The first one is from Luke chapter one, verse five. What genre is this? Can you tell? This is historical narrative. We'll actually see next week how Luke alerts us to the genre even before we get to verse five. The second one is from Luke 13, verse 20. Can you tell, this is more difficult. Can you tell what genre this is? It's the parable, it's the parable in the words of Jesus. So we can talk about this more later, but you don't read a parable the same way you read a, a historical narrative. That would be like reading a recipe as if it's a menu. All right, we can talk way more about genre and all the different types in the Bible some other time. For now, we're gonna move on. The third thing we want to observe is the structure. I'm not gonna say much about this now, but here we're identifying the boundaries of a text. What that means is where should we start reading? Where should we stop reading? We're identifying the beginning, middle of end, if that makes sense in a particular text. If it's a story, we're gonna look at the setting, the pro problem, the climax, the resolution. We're looking for any parallelism, any structural elements. If all that's confusing, don't worry. We're gonna see the importance of this uh, next week and you'll start getting more and more comfortable with identifying structural elements. Finally, we're observing keywords or motifs within the text. A motif is a word or pair of words or group of words that are thematically related to each other. Let me give you an example from the Gospel of John chapter one. 
So you don't need to read this. I'm not going to give you time to read it. But one of the motifs in John 1 is the light, dark motif. Let me show you. Light, light, shines, darkness, darkness, light, 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 and lightens. Pretty obvious, right? This is actually a really important motif that is actually carried throughout the Gospel of John, and it helps us understand the meanings of later texts. All right, so that's observing the text. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the original genre, structure, keywords, motifs. Here's now where the words get a little bit fancier, okay? We're not just going to look at the text. We're also going to look at what's called the co-text. Co means beside or alongside. So the co-text is simply the text beside the text. So for instance, next week, we're going to look at Luke 1, 1 through 38. And the co-text for that passage is Luke 1, verse 39 through 80. And Luke 2, and Luke 3 and the rest of the Gospel of Luke for that matter. The point here is that the more you read before and after your particular passage, the better you'll understand it. And this will definitely matter for us when we look at our passage next week. We're also going to look into the context. Con means with. So here we are looking at what comes with the text, meaning what is the situation surrounding the text? There are two types of context we want to explore. First is the historical context. What was happening at this time? Who was King Herod of Judea? What was the political situation? What was fresh in the memories of the characters and the first audience that read the Gospel of Luke? What happened shortly after? We're looking at the historical context. The second type of context is the social or cultural context. Here's the thing. First century people didn't think, talk, and act like we do. They inhabited a very different world. They had different values. They had different perspectives. And it's important for us to explore and learn about their social and cultural context so that we can better understand what's going on. I don't know where I found this quote, so I apologize for the lack of a reference. But one way of putting it is to say that the Bible was written for us, but the Bible wasn't written to us. The Bible was written for us and for all peoples in all times and places, but it wasn't written to us. And the more we understand the audience it was written to, the more we will understand the meaning. So obviously we're gonna to need to help with this step. And this is where good Bible teachers, good commentaries and other reference works can be helpful. Uh, we can talk about this more later, but that's the context. The final thing we're looking at, here's another fancy word. We're gonna look at what's called the intertext. Inter means between. So this means we are going to look not just at the text, the co-text, and the context, but we're going to look at other texts and the relationships between them. Uh, so if we're studying the Gospel of Luke, we might glance over at the Gospel of Matthew, and we might compare and contrast the birth narratives of Jesus in Matthew and Luke. One of the most important texts to read and study when we are reading intertextually is the Old Testament. Uh, we'll see an example of this next week, but we're here we're looking for citations, allusions, and echoes of the Old Testament. What does all that mean? We'll talk about it later. But if the Gospel of Luke refers to something in the Old Testament, it's going to be very important for us to study and understand the passage to which he's referring. All right, that's it. That's what we're doing. Whew. Now, I know we just spent the bulk of our time with step one, but just to give a recap, when we're studying the Bible, we want to not only observe and look at the text, co-text, context, intertext, we also want to question and determine and reflect. And listen, if you feel like all this is too much and too complicated, I do want to remind you of something at this point as we conclude. Remember, this is your first day in Russia. <laughs> don't fly home quite yet. Don't fly home just because you don't know the language. You're going to get used to it. You'll learn it. You'll figure it out. And I will tell you this with absolute certainty. Reading the Bible well will make it come alive. It'll make it come alive. And in the process, if we're spiritually open, the Holy Spirit can then use it to transform us more and more into the image of Jesus. Now, having said all that, I do want to leave you with a quote that is long haunted me. As deep as we get into the text, the co-text, the context, and the intertext, as deep as we get into our study, I want this quote to always haunt us. 
You ready for it? It's from the 19th century Christian philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, and he writes this. The matter is quite simple. The Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we're obliged to act accordingly. Take any words in the New Testament and forget everything except pledging yourself to act accordingly. My God, you will say, if I do that, my whole life will be ruined. How would I ever get on in the world? Herein lies the real place of Christian scholarship. Christian scholarship is the church's prodigious invention to defend itself against the Bible, to ensure that we can continue to be good Christians without the Bible coming too close. Oh, priceless scholarship, what would we do without you? Now, I love this quote because it's just dripping with sarcasm, isn't it? <laughs> Listen, he's overstating the point. He's obviously overstating the point. After all, the title of the work is Provocations, right? Proper study of the Bible should help us understand it more, not less. And much of the New Testament, let alone the Bible, is not, in fact, easy to understand. But here's the important point. We never want to get so lost in our study, so lost in the context, the inner text, or whatever. We never want to get so lost in our study that we miss whatever the Bible is calling us to do a proper reading of the Bible, a proper understanding of the Bible should always lead us not just to understand it, but to stand under it. All right, that's it. Your homework next week is to read Luke 1, 1 through 38, and to observe, question, determine, and reflect. And in case you're wondering, no, you don't have to do the homework. I won't assume next week that you've read Luke 1 let alone studied it. But next week's lesson will be better, will be more enlightening and engaging if you do spend a little bit of time this week in Luke 1 before we meet. Without saying